I'm Matt Roth with Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation. The Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium is an NIH Common Fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Hamida Sultana, Assistant Professor in the Center for Molecular Medicine, Department of Biological Sciences at Old Dominion University. The title of her presentation is Arthropod Exosomes as Slingshots for Transmission of Tick and Mosquito-Borne Flaviviruses. Hamida? Yes. So, hi, this is Hamida, and uh, as uh, Matt said, the title of my presentation is Arthropod Exosomes as Slingshots for Transmission of Tick and um, mosquito barn uh, sleeve viruses. Oops, I have difficulty moving my slide presentation. Okay, there you go, okay. So you see that I have both ticks and mosquitoes here because my lab works with both ticks and mosquitoes as the very important arthropod vectors. So sleeve viruses are the viruses in the genus of flavivirus and they belong to the family Flaviviridae. And this genus includes some of the most important human pathogens like the West Nile virus, the dengue virus that comes in four serotypes. One of the new serotypes has also been identified. We have also the tick-borne encephalitis virus and one of the most important of this group is the Powazan virus that has been found in the United States. We have the very well-studied yellow fever virus and the latest Zika virus. And this group of viruses have also several other flaviviruses which may cause encephalitis like the Japanese encephalitis virus and the St. Louis encephalitis virus. So the flaviviruses, they got their name from the yellow fever virus and the word flavus means yellow in Latin. So this is due to the nature of the yellow fever virus to cause jaundice in humans. So flare viruses do share several common aspects. They are positive sense single strand RNA viruses of around 10,000 to 11,000 bases. And they have envelope and they have icosahedral nucleocapsid protein. And they are mostly common in size around 40 to 65 nanometer, and they appear very similar in the electron microscope. And shown here is the transmission electron microscope micrograph of the yellow fever virus here. So most of these viruses are actually transmitted by the bite of an infected arthropod, such as a mosquito or tick, and hence they have been also referred as arboviruses. Now, well, why are we so much concerned and study these uh, arthropods? Well, arthropods are medically important vectors. We, for example, our children, our pets, and um, our um, domestic animals, the wildlife, all prefers to be outdoor, enjoying the nature's beauty and bounty, and hence encounter to the bites of these infectious arthropods and come back to the arthropod bond diseases. So the vector bond diseases are of major concern to the mankind. Um, the, several human deaths have been shown to be happening due to the vector bond diseases. So now what are these vector or orthopod bond diseases? These are diseases that are transmitted to the humans and other animals by the bite of an infected insect, which could be a mosquito or an another orthopod such as tick. So nearly half of the world's population has been um, shown to be at risk because of the vector bond diseases. And uh, this is here a geographical map that indicates the deaths from the vector bond diseases to be severe in Africa, South, South America, some parts of Asia, and North America. So the transmission cycle of a vector bond pathogen involves two phases. In the first stage, the pathogen persists for a longer period of time in the orthopod vector, where it could establish relationships such as beneficial or symbiotic type of relationship. And then it is transmitted by the bite of this infected orthopod to the humans, where it causes severe disease or pathogenesis, which could be really harmful to the human host. And remember that the human hosts are incidental hosts. They can be accidentally being infected, not just that the pathogen likes to be in the vertebrate host. So several vectors are responsible for the transmission of um, orthopod bond diseases to humans, and some of them include the, um, the uh, sand fleas and kissing bugs and, of course, the ticks and mosquitoes. So our research is focused on two of the important vectors, the mosquitoes and the ticks. 
We study the mosquito-borne diseases such as the vestinal neuroinvasion and neuropathogenesis, um, and also the dengue hemorrhagic fever. And recently, we have just started working on addressing some of the Zika virus complications. And we also have been extensively working on tick-borne viruses, which are uh, uh, mostly the, the, the tick-borne encephalitis virus, the Poisson and the Langert viruses. And we also do contribute to some of the bacterial uh, pathogenesis brought by or vectored by the exodus capillaris ticks, such as the rickets cell pathogens, or in specific, the anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is an obligate intracellular pathogen. So this map here shows the geographic distribution of the black leg tick. Uh, which is the Exodus capillaris ticks and the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, as noted by the orange color or the yellow color here. Um, so notice that the northeast is the, the part for both of these vectors to be spreading the vector-borne diseases. Now, there are a lot of thoughts and ideas that some of the ticks have been um, kind of traveling down from the northeast to the south side and the south side ticks have been traveling to the north side. So we believe that Virginia could be the hub for these uh, vector um arthropods, which would be one of the very important scenario to be addressed. So some of the potential um, interventions to combat the vector bond diseases are to design the anti-pathogen therapies, such as designing vaccines using the pathogen molecules, or to design the transmission blocking vaccines against vector molecules, or using the attractants or repellents and novel insecticides against the vectors. And our main research is focused on the transmission blocking vaccines. Like we would like to use some of the arthropod determinants or molecules to address this very important question. So we have proposed that, for example, in case of ticks, when the larval ticks acquire pathogens by feeding on infected vertebrate hosts and become infected, these larval ticks will then mold into nymphs, which is the next stage in the life cycle of ticks. And this is a metamorphosis process. And humans could be accidentally encountering these infected nymphs while taking a hike or a, a, a walking in the nature. So in humans, we would envision two different scenarios, one group being non-vaccinated and the other group being vaccinated here. Now, in case of the non-vaccinated group, the individuals can become infected and lead to pathogenesis, where some of the other individuals would clear the infection, showing resistance to the, in to the pathogen. And the group that has been vaccinated, we believe that most of them would be protected from the vaccine. However, there could be some non-responders that may become infected. And we have proposed this in one of these recent articles that is shown there. So now when we look at the how the transmission blocking vaccines work in humans, so when the transmission blocking vaccines are administered into humans, these vaccines would generate or produce antibodies against this vector molecule in humans. And now these freely circulating antibodies would be uptaken by the bite of an uh, uh, orthopod vector, such as ticks or mosquitoes here. So when they take the blood meal along with the blood meal, they would take up the antibody and the parasite. Now, what we assume that these antibodies that are taken up by the uh, vectors would block the parasite transmission into the orthopod midgut or salivary glands, and thereby not allowing these orthopods to be infectious and um, uh, pass the pathogen when they bite the uninfected vertebrate host. So, in this transmission uh, blocking vaccine strategy, we mainly rely on the generation of antibodies against vector molecules that are involved in pathogen recognition, development, and or transmission. And both healthy, which are shown in blue, or the, or the infected, which are shown in red. So these individuals will be immunized against the antigens. Uh, when the uninfected vector takes a um, uh, blood meal from the infected vertebrate, so this will also be allowed to take up the transmission, transmission blocking vaccine antigen specific antibodies. So these antibodies therefore inhibit the pathogen development or transmission to the infected individual. So when these orthopods bite these infected individuals and again allow try to allow the transmission to the healthy individuals, we mean to say that there will be a block here. There will be no transmission of the parasite or the pathogen to the healthy individual. So this has been very um, uh, kind of well described, and uh, but there is actually no data available on any of the successful transmission blocking vaccine. So my previous and current uh, study has uh, used approaches uh, from different fields. 
So, of course, we would then say that I have my antibodies for transmission blocking and we can kind of like challenge those microbes to be fighting with us. So this is a kind of a little comedy slide here that you are really protected and you can really um, challenge those microbes. So in our research, we have been using approaches from different fields, from the fields of uh, medical entomology or vector biology. We also do use the uh, bacterial pathogenesis, virology, um, and also, of course, the vaccine development. So our intention is basically to help for the treatment, prevention, and eradication of the orthopod bond diseases. So we definitely will be continuing this fight against the orthopod bond diseases. So despite the significance of ticks as important medical vectors, we know very little about the transmission modes of the tick-borne viruses and other tick-borne pathogens to the vertebrate host. So my lab research interest is basically to identify and understand as well as address some of the novel pathogen transmission blocking strategies using the orthopod molecules or the determinants. Of course, we do also work on identifying novel receptors for the flavivirus entry into the host and other vertebrate cells. We do work on pan flavivirus vaccine strategies and uh, we do look at some of the novel chemical complexes for therapeutic approaches. And partly we also do work with the tick anaplasma phagos film interactions. So what I'm going to be talking to you today is about uh, the novel pathogen transmission blocking strategies using the vertebrate or orthopod uh, exosomes as the mediators. So just to give you a few background, there are several studies that have used the uh, transcriptome and proteomic analysis. Uh, from the vector host, and they have done a lot of beautiful classification and have given importance to several class of molecules that would be important in facilitating the pathogen transmission. But still, there are no vaccines or transmission blocking vaccines available for such uh, pathogen treatment. So we raise the question, transmission modes of orthopod one flaviviruses belonging to the family of flaviviridae, which are poorly understood. So. What we thought is under the umbrella of the host pathogen interactions, we thought of addressing the modes of transmission and the modes of pathogen shedding. So we thought that these are very important parts or um, uh, groups to be addressed other than like routes of entry and susceptibility and the reservoir host. So we use different approaches to understand this pathogen transmission or shedding strategies. We, of course, use the molecular biology approaches along with genetics. We do use bioinformatics, biochemistry. We do extensively use cell culture and cell biology, virology. And of course, we do also work with, with uh, uh, neuroinvasion and neuropathogenesis. So we address some of the neurobiology part of these flaviviruses as these are neurotrophic viruses. We do also include the animal studies in our um, um, analysis. So our hypothesis was does extracellular vesicles or EVs or exosomes do facilitate flavivirus transmission from the medically important vectors such as the ticks and mosquitoes. So I will be showing you the data for both ticks and mosquitoes. So are exosomes important means of communication and transmission between the vector and the vertebrate host? So this has also been addressed. And then we are trying to um, conclude with the transmission strategies used by the flaviviruses to exit the orthopods and infect the human host. So these are some of our main important envisions um, to approach. So I would be <coughs> talking to you first with the tick bond flavivirus transmission through the orthopod exosomes. We just, <coughs> sorry, I have some, some kind of pathogen bothering me in my throat. Okay, let's continue on. So we looked at the, uh, the, one of the uh, pathogen called Langat virus. So this is very close to the tick bond um, encephalitis virus. So uh, this is a BSL2 pathogen and it makes us to study easily. So what we first did is we analyzed the replication of this <coughs> tick bond Langat virus, <coughs> which in short form referred as LGTV in tick cells. So we found that LGTV readily infected the exodiscapillaris IC6 cells, which have been used here in this analysis. So we found increased viremia at 72 hours post-infection when compared to the 24 and 48 hours post-infection. <coughs> Next, we isolated the exosomes by <coughs> density gradient centrifugation techniques. 
such as the Opsiprep DG exo isolation. We also, of course, use some of the ultracentrifugation techniques, and uh, we found that the exosomes were uh, whatever independently isolated by either by differential ultracentrifugation or by the uh, DG exo isolation, they all yielded similar results. So, however, we had to do some slight modifications with our arthropods where we increased the spin times. And of course, we did select the 72 hours post infection as the time point for the isolation of exosomes from the tick cells due to their higher loads that were present in the cells. So we considered just analyzing the 72-hour post-infection. So what you see here are the electron uh, um, microscopy images uh, performed on the tick cell-derived exosomal fractions. So that they showed the presence of purified orthopod exosomes, which were size ranges of 30 to um, 250 uh, nanometer in diameter. These are very similar to the exosomes that were isolated from the mammalian cells. So we could not see any much detailed differences between the orthopod and the mammalian exosomes. So we have the um, uh, the LGT infected panel here, where you see that um, we do have uh, kind of more exosomes. So this is a representative image, and I'll come to the uh, quantitative analysis. Now, the lower part B panel here shows you the immunoblotting analysis, which is done with the highly cross-reactive 4G2 monoclonal antibody that recognizes the viral envelope protein, um, um, and we have used the, uh, the exosomal fractions here from the uninfected tick cells or the LGT-infected tick cells. So what you see here is that uh, we are able to detect enriched amounts of our E protein uh, that were found to be present in fraction four and five in comparison to the other fractions. And as expected, we did not uh, detect any E protein in the fractions from the uninfected controls that serve as our controls. So the take home message from here is that the tick cell derived exosomes contain uh, the LCT viral E protein here that is found to be more enhanced in the lower fractions four and five. So when we did some quantitative analysis on the, um, the group of uh, cryoimages that we had, we were able to see that the exosomes isolated from orthopod cells, they showed a heterogeneous population of vesicles, which is also being found here that you see a heterogeneous population of vesicles in this cryo-EM analysis. So in order to understand this heterogeneity in exosome population, we did some quantitative analysis using images collected from both the uninfected um, and the LGT-infected tick cell-derived uh, exosomes. What we noted is that majority of the exosomes were sizes, um, uh, be sizes between 50 to 100 um, nanometer um, in both LGT infected in comparison to the uninfected. So both groups showed more percentage of those uh, smaller exosomes of 50 to 100 nanometer in size. But remember, we have different number of uh, total number of exosomes here, 138 and 200 over here with the infected group. So this data suggested that LGT infection may perhaps enhance the production and or release of exosomes. And when we quantitated this, indeed this was true where the number of exosomes uh, were found to be counted to be more here. Although there could be a lot of parameters that need to be uh, addressed that when we take the cryo Im images, uh, we cannot really control some of the um, technical difficulties and uh, the areas that we image. But this is still the very, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> non-conclusionary data. So next, we did the RT-PCR analysis, uh, which revealed the presence of the total um, mRNA for LGT in exosomes that was isolated from uh, LGT-infected tick cells. We also determined the presence of both the positive and the negative since uh, LGT RNA strands in these tick cell-derived exosomes. Now, what is, what is this suggesting to us is that there is a replicative form of the LGT present in exosomes, which could be um, infectious and replicative when it is going to the uh, recipient cells. Now, the presence of the LGT E protein in tick cell derived exosomes was further recognized by the uh, SDS page, followed by immunoblotting with the 4G2 antibody. <coughs> So the higher E protein loads were also detected, that is being shown here, in total cell lysates and in comparison to the exosome lysates. So immunoblotting with the, <coughs> sorry for that. <coughs> so immunoblotting with monoclonal anti-longet virus NS1, which is one of the clone that we use here is 
6E11. So this antibody was received from the BEI resources, which is one of the common uh, resources that we would like to acknowledge. So this also showed the presence of the NS1 uh, protein in both tick cell, tick cell derived exosomes and the total lysase. So although the higher NS1 protein loads were evident in the total lysates here, but the presence of NS1 in tick cell derived exosomes further confirmed that these arthropod exosomes contain the LGT proteins other than the E protein, the envelope protein. So remarkably, we also detected the presence of the thick HSP protein in the exosomal lysate. So HSP70 is a heat shock cognate protein 70, which is actually a specific exosomal marker in uh, mammalian cells. And we were able to detect the presence of the HSP70 as an exosomal marker in the thick cell-derived exosomes. Uh, however, we did not find any differences uh, between the uninfected and the infected exosomal lysates. So presumably due to maybe to low amounts uh, present in the cell lysates, we were not able to detect the HSP70 in the tested conditions. So when we looked at the total profile, which we considered as um, a kind of a control here, so the total protein uh, lysate prepared from same batch of uninfected or LGT infected tick cell derived exosomes or from whole tick cells, they served as loading control. But however, what we noted is that some of the uh, LGT uh, infected um, samples had um, higher expression or higher loads of some of the proteins that have been shown here by this arrow market. So we're currently an analyzing these. We have identified these proteins, but we are characterizing those and um, trying to address these as important exosomal determinants or molecules on the arthropod exosomes that may mediate the transmission of pathogens such as LGTV and perhaps other tick-borne encephalitis viruses. So our next turn was to show that um, we sent this paper out to several places. Many reviewers commented that maybe you have contamination of viruses in your preparations, and that's why you're detecting the viral proteins and RNA. We did several uh, tests and analysis that I'm not able to show up here everything, but we did RNAs a treatment to show that the indeed the RNA is present inside the exosomes. And here are some of the other uh, subsequent assays that we did, such as the native page, uh, which also confirmed the presence of the LGT proteins inside the tick cell derived exosomes. So I will tell you briefly here what we did in the native page, which is followed by the immunoblotting with 4G to antibody. Uh, this actually showed enhanced levels of LGT E protein almost at a very higher molecular mass of 250 kilodalton in the native state in exosomes treated uh, for like 30 minutes with uh, at room temperature or um, treated for 30 minutes room temperature with Triton X100, and we are using 0.03% of Triton X100 here. Um, I hope everybody knows Triton X100 is a detergent that lies the exosomal lipid bilayer membranes in comparison to the exosomes treated for three rounds of freeze-thaw cycles, so basically we freeze and thaw these exosomes for three times at, for one hour at minus 80 degrees, or we left a group as untreated exosomes that were just held at four degrees until we are ready with these treatments. So the total protein lysis prepared from uninfected or LGT infected tick cell derived exosomes with similar treatments served as controls in this immunoblotting analysis. Then we had detection of LGT E protein uh, that is shown here. Uh, inside the exosomes was further analyzed by the E-protein 4G2 antibody bead binding assay, which is shown here. So basically in this assay, we, we kept three groups, the untreated group, the isotype antibody treated group, or the 4G2 antibody treated group. And one group was uh, kept as untreated. The other group was treated with the four, uh, for the GW4869 inhibitor for exosome. Uh, release inhibitor, so this is that inhibitor, the GW inhibitor. So what you see is that we do not see any difference between the untreated group or the 4G2 antibody treated group. Now what are these experiments talking about? They basically suggest that if the viral E protein was outside the exosomal preparations, then our 4G2 antibody that highly cross-react with the E protein from LGT would have bound this uh, LGT E protein and wouldn't have allowed the enhanced signal or the equal signal when compared to the untreated. So we are seeing no difference when compared to the untreated or the isotype antibody treatment control suggesting that 4G2 um, antibody could not bind any of the E protein perhaps because there was no E protein outside the exosomes. It was contained inside the exosomes. So um, next we uh, did um, several assays to, to 
to find out that our exosomes are infectious. So we did some plaque assays, which were performed with the tick cell-derived exosome pellet fractions. Um, and these assays yielded plaques at dilutions of 1 is to 10 and 1 is to 100, but they were too numerous to count. And around 22, uh, 22 plaques were obtained in the dilution of 1 is to 1,000. However, no plaques were found uh, or detected in the plates where virus cells were treated with the supernatant fraction. Now, what is this supernatant fraction? So this is the fraction that we collect before pelleting our exosomes. So when we have our exosomes pelleted, we collect the supernatant as the subfraction, which should absolutely have no exosomes. Uh, so, because all your exosomes will be pelleted in the in the exosomal fraction. So we use this as a control for most of our assays, and indeed it worked beautifully in all our assays, and also all different salines, what we tested for. So you see that there are absolutely no plots at all three different dilutions. And we have used um, equal um, amounts of these uh, supernatant fractions, uh, converting to these number of plots that we have obtained. So, um, so basically, the plaque assays indicated the presence of infectious viral RNA or proteins in the LGT infected exosomes uh, that resulted in high loads of the LGT in virus cells. So we could see that the virus cells were infectious, and they had increased formation of viral plaques. The plaque assays also further confirmed that the tick cell derived exosomes contain the LGTV RNA and proteins that are capable of replication and forming viable plaques that are that could be highly infectious to the mammalian cells. Now, um, we have also the quantitated this data here that is shown from the plates here. So what you see here are the tick uh, um, exopellates or the tick exosubes that were counted from this plate here. So you see that we could not really um, get the numbers. They were too numerous to count from these upper dilutions. However, when we look at the, uh, the 1 is to 1,000 dilution, we could count those number of plaques. So this data is uh, very important to show that the um, plaques are viable and they are infectious um, and the viruses are replicative. Now, the next slide here showed us that uh, the LGT was also kept, the LGTV uh, RNA and the proteins that were contained in the exosomes were also capable of infecting the human um, cell lines. So what we have used are the human vascular endothelial cells here um, and um, also the human skin cells, the hackett cells. So what we found was that uh, when we use the tick cell derived um, exosomal fractions or in, as control the supernatant fractions, you could see that the, uh, the tick cell derived exosomes were capable of infecting our human skin cells, the, the Hackett cells. And these were these, the numbers that were collected from the different time points of infection. So you see that at 24 hours, we have lesser infection, <clears throat> but when we incubate the human skin cells uh, with the 72-hour um, derived tick cell derived exosomes, there is more infectious dose here. So however, we could not exclude the uh, presence of some viral particles in the soup fraction, so that was shown to be also infectious here in this assay. So, and here what we show is that the Hubex cells were here treated with the exosomes uh, containing uh, LGT virus that were derived from the tick cell uh, uh, cells. And they also have higher infectious dose, so the viral loads at 48 hours post-infection showed that uh, the, um, the, the uh, tick cell derived exosomes are infectious to the human blood cells. So this data suggests to us that the LGTV RNA contained in the tick cell derived exosomes is infectious and it can replicate in the mammalian cells or the human cells. So we also perform some uh, transfer assays to test whether uh, tick cell derived exosome transmission of LGTV from uh, infected tick cells to the uninfected nice human keratinocytes. So what we basically did here is that we plated the tick cells in the upper panel or the upper insert and allowed those cells to secrete exosomes and transmigrate to the lower panel where we had the, the human skin cells. So indeed you can see that the tick cell derived infectious exosomes could in fact infect the Hackett cells that were kept naive or uninfected. Now we are determining the loads of the, um, the, um, the cells that were treated with either the tick cell derived exosomes or the tick cell derived exosomes treated with the exosome release inhibitor or just the viral stocks that were used here. So next what we did is we moved on the study to the upper mammalian side from the arthropod exosomes. 
So what we did here is that we went to see if the exosomes in vertebrate system also do facilitate the transmission of the LGT virus. And indeed, it was found to be yes. So briefly, what I will tell you here is that these are the LGT loads in the brain endothelial and the neural cells. So we are using the entubate cells here for the um, infection of LGT. So you see that LGT replicates in both the uh, brain uh, microvascular endothelial cells and the uh, neuronal cells. And this is the data showing you that the, um, the brain endothelial cells do also have infectious viral RNA at different time points in their exosomes. And they do contain both the positive and the negative loads. And they, these exosomes derived from the brain endothelial barrier cells are capable of infecting the naive uh, neuronal uh, cells, like the NTA cells. This is the data here. And of course, we did similar transfer assays where we showed that the brain endothelial cell derived infectious exosomes were capable of infecting the naive neuronal cells, the NTA cells that are used here. So I'm not going to really go over and get you all these details. This is the work from uh, my PhD graduate student, Mr. Uh, Zhu et al. So please refer the PLOS pathogen to 2018 paper. So briefly, we have been able to isolate uh, successfully the mammalian uh, exosomes from the N2A cells, and these are the cryo -EM images, quantification, showing again the uh, most of the exosomes to be in the percentages of 50 to 100 nanometer in size. And uh, we found that the number of exosomes produced were more in case of the LGT-infected neuronal cells when compared to the uninfected groups. This is the detection of the E protein in the different fractions that we collected. We're also using as control the mammalian CD9 and HSP70 as the exosomal uh, markers. And these are the total loads of um, LGT uh, RNA present in the exosomes. And this is a copy number. We're detecting both the positive and the replicative viruses here. And this is one of the important assay that I would like to go a little bit in detail. So these exosomes were derived from N2A cells, and then we treated them with RNSA. So one group, we left them um, untreated, uh, and the other group, we treated them with RNSA. And these are the exosomes that were used as control from the uninfected group. So you see that there is no difference between the treatment or the untreated group. So suggesting that there is no viral RNA present outside the exosome, suggesting that our preparations are clean and the viral RNA is contained inside the exosomes. So here we are detecting the viral E protein again and the CD9 as, um, also as the exosomal um, uh, control for the exosomal preparations, and the total uh, protein profile show as the control here. So this is the native page done in a similar way as we did with the orthopod exosomes. Um, this is the ELISA assay, which is performed in a similar way to the native page, and the bead assay was performed in a similar way. So this is all the data from the n 2 cells. Now, what I wanted to show is that the um, the N2A cell derived exosomes were also capable of transmitting uh, the uh, pathogen loads to the NICE cells. So these were the assays done on the virus cells where we are infecting them with the N2A infectious exosomes. So you see that uh, the exosomal fraction, the, the, they are several plots in the upper dilutions, like 1 is to 10 and 1 is to 100. And we have few countable plots in the lower dilutions of 1 is to 1,000. And these are the control plates, which were where the cells were treated with superintendent fractions. And we are quantitating here, showing that they are um, infectious plaques present in the dilution of 1 is to 10 and 100. And this is the data with the reinfection, where we are using the infectious N2A cell-derived exosomes and allowing them to uh, reinfect the naive N2A cells. So suggesting that uh, the exosomes derived from any of the infectious cells would be uh, transmitting the pathogen loads to the recipient cells, which would be naive and uninfected, which is very important to know. So here is the data for uh, the cortical neurons, which was uh, also being included as one of the primary cultures, because uh, N2A cell is a in vitro derived cell line. So this data is also very much similar. We are looking at the infection kinetics of the LGT in the cortical neurons uh, from the murine system. And these are the, the total loads of the LGTV and the positive and the negative loads. We are looking at the E protein and the exosomal marker CD9 presence. And you could see that uh, we have 
have uh, really enhanced amounts of the E protein present in the exosome fraction in the uh, mouse uh, cortical neurons when compared to the salicylate. And we also could detect the presence of the NS1 in these uh, mouse um, cortical neural exosomes. And we did similar plaque assays and uh, found the viable plaques in uh, the exosomal fraction. No plaques were obtained from the supernatant fractions. We did some reinfection studies where we plated the naive uh, cortical neurons and allowed them to be infected via the infectious exosomes derived from the other independent batch of uh, cortical neurons. And indeed, those um, in exosomes were infectious on the naive cortical neurons. So now, since we all know that the exosomes fuse and release, and this is a common mechanism happening all the time, so when the extracellular vesicles or exosomes are outside, they have two fates. Either they can undergo fading or they can fuse back to the plasma membrane and deliver the material to the recipients. So we wanted to understand if platinum has any role in here because platinum is one of the important molecules that decorates those um, plasma membranes uh, and pinch off the vesicles inside. So the material has been basically uh, taken inside the vesicle and then later released. So we wanted to address the importance of platinum here. So what we did next was that uh, we um, looked at the, uh, the catherine molecule and we, we found that when we use the uh, pit stop um, inhibitor, which inhibits the activity of clathrin, you can see that the pit stop treated cells had lower uptake. So meaning to say that clathrin was involved in this exosome mediated viral transmission. Um, and indeed, um, this is one of the very important molecule and we cannot propose this inhibitor for any kind of therapeutics. So later we also did some work with the, uh, the exosome release inhibitor, which is referred as the GW4869. This is a commercially uh, available inhibitor, which in fact um, inhibits uh, one of the enzyme called um, SMPD3. So it's, this is the neutral, neutral sphingomyelinase, um, which kind of is heavily involved in producing and releasing the exosomes. So when we use the uh, GW inhibitor on our N2A cells, you could see that just with very small doses of 1 to 10 micromolar of this inhibitor treatment, we could inhibit the LGT viral load in the N2A cells. So this is the data from the uh, N2A uh, cell load. So we also use those inhibited exosomes to reinfect. Now you can see that when you inhibit those exosomes and use them in reinfection kinetic studies, they are not capable of transmitting the pathogen. This is being shown here in panel B. So we indeed wanted to test if treating with inhibitor before or after has any importance or significance. Indeed, yes, there is something where if you inhibit the cells and then infect, we have lesser loads when compared to infection and then using the inhibitor later. So, but however, they both showed uh, comparatively reduced loads of the viruses. So when we use the inhibited exosomes and do plaque assays, you see that uh, compared to DMSO control, we have very few exosomes in the inhibitor treated group that is being quantitated here. So um, we could see that uh, there is a significant reduction in the viral uh, plaque formation when we use the GW inhibitor. So this data was uh, here to look at the virus stock. So if the virus stock is also showing any kind of inhibition when we treat the virus stock with the GW4869 inhibitor, indeed we didn't see any difference in our viral E protein suggesting that the virus stock is not um, um, being uh, considered for the GW inhibitor. So this is similar data which is obtained from the cortical uh, neuronal cells. So we are looking at the treatment of the GW inhibitor here. So you see that there is a reduction. And of course, reinfection is being inhibited. The plaque uh, formation has been reduced when compared to the DMSO control, which has been quantitated here. So what is all this data talking to us? It's basically suggesting to us that um, uh, the LGTV and perhaps the other viruses probably uses exosomes as novel modes of transmission from one neuronal cell to the other neuronal cell. So we expanded this study to the West Nile virus where we could also detect the presence of the West Nile virus replicative RNA in the N2A cell derived exosomes. So the take home 
message from all this work that we published is that when ticks and mosquitoes do bite and infect, they probably would be delivering their uh, pathogen loads via the exosomes, which probably would be replicating in the peripheral system and indeed leading to the neuroinvasion and uh, infection of the brain and the brain cells. So um, exosomes perhaps could be indeed important, not just from the orthopod side, but also in uh, medi mediating the dissemination of the viruses uh, through the uh, mammalian cells. So now I'm heading out to uh, one of the other new chapters that we have been almost uh, trying to publish uh, soon. So this is the work uh, of another PhD graduate student. So we are looking at the mosquito bond flavors transmission through the um, mosquito exosomes. So what I'm showing you here are the infection kinetics in the mosquito saline. We are using the Aedes albopictus C636 saline. We have been infecting that saline with the dengue virus too, one of the serotype. So you see that the uh, dengue viral loads are uh, enhanced over the period of infection. Uh, it's basically a time course infection. And these are the exosomal loads in those uh, C636 derived exosomes. So we have been considering uh, the 72-hour infection time point for all our studies. So these are the cryo-EM images from the uninfected C636 cells or the dengue virus 2 infected C636 cells. So you see that we do again see a heterogeneous population of exosomes. We have done the quantifications. Um, and I'm not going to be showing you the data. We have seen that uh, there is no difference uh, in the mosquito cell-derived exosomes from either uninfected or infected group. So now what you see here is that we are looking at the presence of the dengue virus to uh, viral RNA. We are looking at the capsid gene, so we detect the presence of the capsid mRNA transcripts in these uh, C636 derived exosomes. And indeed, we are also looking at the other serotype, the, the dengue virus 3, and we have been able to detect the capsid uh, mRNA transcripts for the dengue virus 3. So it is indeed uh, kind of probably the similar mechanism for all uh, serotypes of dengue viruses. And this is the, um, the complementary data suggesting that we are detecting the E protein in the, um, uh, in the mosquito cell-derived exosomes. And uh, we are also able to detect the dengue E protein from the dengue virus 3 serotype. So indeed, uh, we have been able to show the presence of both the E proteins in the uh, mosquito cell-derived exosomes. So later we went ahead to see if uh, any of the fractions that we have been isolating as six different fractions contain any of the viruses either inside the exosomes or outside. So here are the cryo-EM images which were done on the OptiPrep gradient centrifugation. So you see that we do not have seen any viral particles or virions either inside the exosomes or outside the exosomes. This also suggests that our preparations are clean um, from the viral contaminations. So using these um, fractions, we are trying to detect here the viral E protein. We see that the dengue 2 um, E protein is highly enriched in the fraction 5 and 6. So we have used the HSP70 as a um, uh, exosomal marker for the mosquito cell-derived exosomes, although we have characterized the importance and the role of this molecule in the mosquito cell-derived exosomes. So this is also going to be in our paper here. I'm not going to be showing you the data due, due to the time limit. Um, and the total protein profiles serve as the loading controls here. So we indeed went ahead and did very similar studies to show that these viral proteins or RNA is contained inside the exosomes. We did the RNA treatment studies where we see no differences in the exosomes treated groups or the uh, viral groups. So we, we do indeed see no difference. And these are the native page done in a very similar fashion as I described in the case of the TIC and LGT interactions where we could detect the presence of the E protein inside the exosomes. And we have seen no differences when we treat them with the antibodies for 4G2 or isotype. So this is the exosome group and the dengue viral stock, just to show as a positive control that indeed treatment with 4G2 antibody uh, takes away most of the viral particles. That's why you have a lower signal here when compared to no differences here. And this is the data from the um, uh, Triton X100 treatment where we treated these um, cells with um, the exosome that have been pre-treated with Triton X100 and we are trying to determine the fluorescence here. So we do see more fluorescence here because Triton would um, top the lipid bilayers and lyse these exosomes. And a similar way we are showing this data with the ELISA. Now here we are trying to show that the mosquito cell-derived exosomes are capable of infecting the naive cells. So this is the data with the uh, mosquito cells. 
So you see that uh, we are trying to infect the uh, mosquito cells with independent um, isolated exosomes from another mosquito cell batch or the superintendent fraction. So you see no infectious dose or no um, uh, E protein detection here when compared to the exosomal fraction. So we would also able to see that the plaques um, were able to form on the virus cells that were uh, infected via the infectious C636 cell-derived exosomes. We were able to detect a larger number of plaques in the deletion of 1 is to 100. And um, in the EDS group, we could not detect any plaques, suggesting that the mosquito cell-derived exosomes are indeed uh, infectious and they are capable of forming viable viral plaques. And this is the reinfection data from um, mosquito cell-derived exosomes that are infectious on either on mosquito cells or mouse genetic cells or the human skin cells, the Hackett cells, or the human blood cells. So you see that the mosquito cell-derived exosomes are capable of transmitting the viral load to all these naive um, arthropod or the mammalian cells. Now here we are using the GW inhibitor to inhibit um, the loads of the uh, Degni virus 2 while well, RNA. So what you see here that when we treat the mosquito cells with different uh, doses of the GW inhibitor, we do have a reduction in the viral load, so which suggests that GW inhibitor could also be a wonderful therapeutic for uh, blocking the transmission of pathogen or parasites from the orthopod to the vertebrate side. And this is the data with the uh, e-protein where we have treated the mosquito cells with different doses of the um, uh, GW inhibitor. You see that um, the viral e-protein is very lower at the 15 micromolar treatment. And uh, we are showing you both the exosome loads and the cellulite loads of the e-protein and the total protein profile serves as a control here. Now we did some immunoprecipitation assays um, on the lysis that were treated with the GW inhibitor. What you see here is that in comparison to the DMSO treated control, the 15 macromolar treated group has reduced amount of the E protein in, in both cell lysis and in also in the exosomal lysis. So this is again the in reinfection kinetics where we use the in the uh, exosomes that have been treated with the inhibitor um, and allowing them to reinfect the nice cells. So you see that the uh, the viral loads are lower here in those treated groups. And this is the transfer assay that was done in a very similar fashion where the mosquito cells were allowed to uh, to kind of like produce exosomes, transmigrate those on the uh, on the Huex cells that were plated on the on the lower uh, plate, and they were allowed to infect through the mosquito um, cell-derived infectious exosomes. So what we are looking at here are the loads of the capsid uh, mRNA transcripts, and you see that when we use the exosomal fraction. Uh, we have a um, uh, kind of infection here, and these are the infections done through the viral uh, stock. And this is the group where the exosomes from mosquito cells were treated with the GW inhibitor, which had almost no reinfection kinetics or the reinfection. So what are the main conclusions from our study? So our studies show you the first discovery of the orthopod exosomes, and we have been able to show that the, uh, the tick-borne tick viruses and the mosquito-borne viruses uh, infectious RNA and protein is being contained securely inside those orthopod exosomes, and they are capable of reinfecting the mammalian or the orthopod cells. Uh, both the negative and the positive strands were detected, suggesting the presence of the replicative form of the viruses. And these exosomes also contain the viral proteins um, that are important for infectious cycle. And we do also show that the LGT and the dengue virus contain exosomes were viable. They were secured and highly virulent in all those tested um, conditions, such as the viral block formation assays, the infection kinetics, and the transmigration assays. And uh, we have also been able to show you that the orthopod derived exosomes facilitate transmission and infection of human cells, and inhibition uh, through the GW inhibitor hampers the viral loads. And most importantly, what we would continue in the long run and in the future is that the orthopod exosomes or the exosomal enriched molecules or components, we think of using them as the transmission blocking vaccine strategies. So we have been extensively working on this and we have several work coming up. Please catch up with our literature to, to see more. And this is my hardcore group that have uh, really contributed a lot. The work on LGT virus was the work from one of my 
talented PhD graduate student, Mr. Vinchizu, and the work on dengue virus is the work of my another talented PhD graduate student, Mr. Ashish Aura, and there'll be more work coming up from the other students. And I would like to acknowledge my collaborators here, Dr. Krish Nilakanta from ODU, and some of the uh, um, very interesting collaborators from UTMB, Dr. Sherman and Utsan have been extremely helpful. I would like to thank Dr. Mundalo for providing as uh, the tick cells, Dr. John F. Anderson, my long-term collaborator, providing us several ticks and other samples, Dr. Pletno uh, from NIH for helping us on the LCT studies, and some of the other uh, colleagues like Dr. Kalpes Bay and uh, Lady Zid, who are my long-term collaborators. I would like to, in special, thank NIH for uh, the funding as R1 to work on the kid cell pathogens, but I surely need funding to expand my work on viruses. And um, absolutely, I would love to thank ODU for giving me this a place to work and enhance my research, and AIL for giving me all the required training. And I would like to especially thank the University of Virginia to help me set up my BSL-3 labs to expand my work on um, um, the uh, flaviviruses such as West Nile and Pawazan. And I'm happy to take any questions here. Thank you. I'll ask one. This is Matt. Uh, sure, Matt, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, very nice. You, you talked about a, a couple of viruses there, and you've looked at a, a few and studied others. Could you comment on just what you think? Is this going to be a general mechanism? Or is it going to be for certain classes or orders of viruses? Or do you have any thoughts on that or any data out there that might suggest how uh, general this mechanism might be? I would say that this could be perhaps um, mostly a general mechanism for most of the intracellular pathogens, including viruses because I do have uh, colleagues who work with HIV, HCV, and they have also detected their viral proteins and molecules in exosomes. And um, I think this will be one of the very easy way of transmitting the pathogen loads. I believe that, uh, for example, like when the viral uh, loads, viral loads are heavier in the periphery, let's say in the spleen or in the blood, it will be easily um, good for the cells to just kind of like keep pinching off vesicles as exosomes so that the viral loads goes low in themselves. So this would allow the migration of these exosomes to different peripheral tissues and indeed probably perhaps to the uh, blood-brain barrier where higher concentration of exosomes may perhaps breach the blood-brain barrier. So I would say that this could be definitely a general mechanism, one of the general mechanism for the uh, pathogen transmission for most of the viruses, I would say. All right, thank you. Actually, I actually have one other question. Uh, sure, Matt, yeah. Any, thought, any, any thoughts on the other types of cargo that might be in those exosomes? Now, you talked about some of it, but, you know, these exosomes can carry quite a few different things. So we are actually, uh, we have already done some kind of profiling, like protein profiling. We have been looking at, uh, at the cargo, especially we are interested on the arthropod exosomes because there is so much known already on the mammalian exosomes and the cargo and, of course, some of the uh, bunch of uh, enriched proteins present in those mammalian exosomes. But so far, nothing is known on the arthropod exosomes other than HSP70 that we show that it's present in tick cell-derived exosomes and mosquito cell-derived exosomes. So we believe that other than HSP70, there should be abundantly um, other proteins that are present. Um, at least we believe that there should be a really larger cargo because arthropods are, um, are very interesting vectors because uh, they have to depend on the nature favorism, right? I mean, for their feeding, for their different activities. So we assume that they may have definitely been a way of keeping a good amount of cargo that may help in uh, transmitting the pathogens and not only that, they help in their blood feeding activity. So we have been working on uh, total profiling. We have uh, been uh, characterizing some of the important and interesting molecules. Uh, so more of our work is going to be coming uh, in shorter times, yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. If uh, no questions, uh, Hamida, thank you again. Appreciate it. And uh, you, we have her contact information. If anybody would like to certainly follow up with her and her slides and presentation will be available on the portal at, uh, sure. uh, in the near future. Yeah, I have my website here, sultanalab.org.